Bring in. Good morning, and sorry for that unexpected delay. Um, Michael, did did you want to say anything before I jump right in? Or well, sure, let's get let's get right to the um, right to the meat. Uh, and again, we do apologize, but let's move forward. We can condense this and get the message across. Today's topic is approaching business owners with uh, sales opportunities. And as you're aware, you know, with the the tax rates and and what's going on in our country today, there's a lot of concern, uh, lack of pension planning. And there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity in the marketplace with, I believe, as Ellen will expand upon, uh, a, a, a big segment of the market that, believe it or not, has not been highly touched. Uh, they have for maybe health care benefits and 401ks, but a lot of small businesses in America, which really drive our country, are really devoid in, in terms of uh, efficient uh, tax leverage planning, life insurance planning, et cetera. So the purpose of today's WebEx uh, many of you know the National Life Group is synonymous for living benefits and tax-free income. Well, today what we're going to do with Ellen Lehman, our Director of Advanced Sales at the National Life Group in Vermont at Home Office, she is going to do a run-through of those exact opportunities, and hopefully what you will derive from this WebEx is conversation points and some ideas and some concepts to be able to approach your business owner relationships and parlay those into some uh, really nice size cases for yourself. So having said that, I, uh, my pleasure to introduce to you Ellen Lamer, Director of Advanced Sales for the National Life Group. Take it away, Ellen. Thanks, Michael, and, and good morning, everybody. And I do thank you for your patience. Uh, we just had a little glitch in getting me into the presentation mode. But here we are. Um, and I love talking about opportunities for business owners, closely held business owners, not publicly traded companies, not those big behemoths that we, we deal with every day, but the mom and pop shops, the the larger organizations, the folks that you, you do deal with every day, you know, the doctors and the attorneys and the mom and dad who, who own the store down the block. Um, what you see on this slide, qualified and non-qualified plans, business succession, Section 79, estate planning, captives, premium finance, and there are others that are built in underneath each of these kind of umbrella topics. Now, obviously, in the, in the next 40 minutes or so, we can't take a deep, deep dive into these areas. But I did want to highlight one or two, maybe three or four of them, um, just so that it, it might be able to, um, to bring to the front of your mind a potential solution for a client that, that you may have or that you may, may run across in the, in the near future. And I'm just going to run through them. Um, I'm going to start with business succession, uh, mainly because I think buy-sell is one of the biggest opportunities that many planners just don't spend enough time working on. Um, some folks feel it's too complicated. Some folks just figure everybody's got them. And I'm here to tell you that probably 50% of the clients that I meet or that the planners call me about, that they've gone in to sit down and talk with the business owners, that they just don't have a buy-sell at all for whatever reason. Um, just couldn't figure out an answer to a question and got stuck. Hadn't thought about it. It's a new business, just didn't do it. It's an old business, the one that they have, they just let go years and years ago. And for the 50% who do, well, sometimes it's it's old. It's got dust on it. Nobody's looked at it in years. Valuations are bad. Planning has changed. Um, life insurance that should have been in place lapsed years ago. So there are so many opportunities for buy-sell planning that I just wanted to put that up first. And I will tell you, on a business timeline, and this little goofy uh, dotted line here is a business timeline, you know, you know that expression, um, in every life there are two certainties, taxes and death? Well, in a business lifetime, there are three certainties. In, a, in, in addition to the, for the individual taxes and death, it's that a business succession event will happen at some time in the life of a business. It's an absolute certainty. Somebody's going to pass away. Somebody's going to become disabled. Somebody's going to retire. Somebody's going to quit. Maybe the business simply terminates and liquidates because the, everybody decided to walk away or it wasn't working well. In any of those situations, those are all business succession events. And what happens to the client at the moment that that transition happens depends a lot on decisions they make with you right now and what the economic realities 
are at the time of the trigger event. So wherever it happens, if it's sooner or later, if it's disability, retirement, death, calling it a day and just quitting, walking out the door, liquidating, it's going to happen. It is so unusual in our business to be able to sit down with a client and say, I know something in your future is going to happen. What I don't know is when, and I'm not quite sure what the trigger is going to be, but let's plan for all of those possibilities. Now, some of the things that you, you need to know when you're dealing in this area, and I'm just going to cross this piece out, that's, that's for situations where we don't have uh, an opportunity to sell the business interest either back to the business or to a co-owner. So you're selling it to a third party or a key person. What you'll need to understand is that in an entity purchase, the business is doing the buyout, nice and simple. In a cross-purchase situation, the co-owners are doing the buy-sell. And in a hybrid, which actually happens to be my favorite because it gives people the options or the ability to decide on what to do when the trigger happens, it's very simple. The business has option number one to do the buyout. If the business doesn't do it, the owners will do a cross-purchase. And then sometimes there's another series of options. If the owners don't do it, you've got the, the, the cross-purchase goes back into a, an entity purchase. And those are the three key types of business succession plans when, when you're talking with an attorney, with the client, and they want to know how does a buy-sell work, that's as simple as it can get. You know, there's not a lot of detail that you need to know. So if you don't know a whole lot about buy-sell planning, you can still have this conversation about, hey, you, know, you can either have the business do the buyout, or your co-owners can do the buyout, or you can create a series of options. Let's go talk to your attorney and figure out which one is the right one. And ultimately, in working with the client's attorney and with the client's accountant, you'll be able to uh, land on the correct one. Now, of course, depending on which one you pick will depend or tell you on how much, where the life insurance needs to be, who's going to own it, and of course, the valuation will tell you how much. Now, there are tools to help you with the next piece, and I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to leave the slideshow for a, a couple of minutes and show you this, this great calculator that we have available that we can make available to you. And when you're talking about buy-sell, I really think our great role, we have two important roles in business succession planning with clients. One is getting them to realize how important it is and helping get, the, get them to the attorney to get it drafted or to get an existing plan amended. So it's getting that client motivated. That's our first big important opportunity here. <clears throat> the second, of course, is helping the client figure out how to pay for the buy-sell, you know, whether it's a death or disability and even at retirement. Classically, you know, forgetting about savings, nobody really uh, is serious. You know, if a client says, well, I'm just going to save for the money, they're not thinking seriously and what we can do is help show them how the cost of saving just doesn't make sense. But the two key ways of funding a buy-sell, installment or borrowing from a third party, and life insurance. And of course, these two, or even the, the savings, are going to be completely influenced by the number of the years to the trigger, the life insurance, of course, by the age and the health at application. What I want to show you right now is let me bring this up. Here we go. So I'm about to show you a nice calculator, very simple to use, that can help demonstrate to a client the economics of the buy-sell. So I said there are two places that we can really help. Motivating the client into understanding they need a buy-sell and getting them to the attorney to get it drafted. The second is the funding and helping them understand the truth behind life insurance and how it is the best plan economically for them in practically every situation. So if I just draw your attention to the Excel spreadsheet here for a second, you get a, you see two different balance sheets. The one on the left here, the business, and I, you know this is just a, a sample case. Don't get too hung up on the numbers. I just want to use it to show the point of the economics. They had a business who uh, that had a value of two million, and I have two owners, Alan and Betty. And so for the business, the future liability on any buy-sell for any individual, any one of either Alan or Betty, would be a million dollars. So on either of their balance sheet, you see 
you have the business interest sitting on their personal balance sheet, which is on the right side. Now, the impact on the family is at the death of either Alan or Betty. Notice this big old X. That means you know, income isn't coming into your personal balance sheet anymore. You still have the capital asset, but benefits aren't being paid for. And now, of course, there is an actual $1 million liability on the, buy, on the, on the business balance sheet. Now, the reason we usually talk about this here, why, why we like to stop in the middle of a buy-sell conversation, is that there are almost always at least two sales to the business owner when we're talking about business succession. One is the buy-sell. The other is the piece that resides right up in here. And that's the classic human life value, replace the loss of income conversation. So we like to remind clients of that right at the, the start of the, the business succession conversation. Now here's the heart of the matter. If this client was doing an installment plan, which is what a lot of clients tend to rely on, and I, I just plugged in some numbers in as, as an example. Let's say this is a 10-year installment. We've got a $50,000 down payment. We're going to have an interest rate of 4%. Let's say the company's got a profit margin of 20%. We're in a little itty-bitty tax rate of 10%. Okay, don't, again, don't worry or fuss the numbers too much. I just want to show you the basic result and the conversation you'd have with the client. And it's very simple. In a 10-year buyout for this client, you're going to be making annual payments of $117,000. But, you know, most business owners know it's not just this check that you have to cut that makes all the difference. It's how much the company has to bring in in sales or patients to see or whatever it is the company is doing, what the gross sales need to be to have the money to write the check. And in this case, based on this 20% profit margin, the company would have to allocate 630000 of sales to be able to complete this buyout. And in the course of time, over the 10 years, they would have paid one point, close to $1.2 million for the total sale, but they would have had to carve out about $6,384,000 in gross sales. Now, that stuns most business owners. It really gets their attention. It's the economic issue here. And of course, right down in here, we actually have the proof. Now, is there another way? Well, of course, if you had the buy-sell funded with life insurance, again, we just picked a couple of premium numbers, 5000 and 5000 here. Let's take a look at the cash flow required. Again, here's basically what I say to a client. If after 10 years, <coughs> what we hope happens happens and you're still alive, and let's say this is on Alan's life, right? Alan, you're still alive 10 years from now. You've purchased this life insurance. You would have spent 50000 in premium. You would have had to allocate a total of 277000 in gross sales to do that. And hey, if we get out 20 years, that would have been 100,000 and just over 500,000 in gross sales. I would draw your attention just to year one. In year one, if we do the installment, we would have had to make 117,000 in annual payments, less than what we would have had to do in 20 years of paying the premium and gross sales of 630000 less than what we would have had to allocate in 20 years of gross sales. Can you see the power here? If the client is looking at this and they go, wow, you know, look how much more doing an installment sale will cost me even then purchasing the life insurance over 20 years, does it make any sense to rely on an installment note when Having the life insurance makes sense. Now, of course, you have more than one life, so the, the next piece is to show what both lives look at, look like. And in this case, for both lives, if you live 20 years, it would be 200000 in premium and about a million in change in gross sales. Still, within the first two years of the cost in the installment plan. Point being, the, in, in the roles that we can play in our life of uh, in working with the client and the client's life and their personal life and in, the, in their business life is that we can demonstrate clearly the economics, the smart use of the money. And of course, if I was doing this with a permanent policy, I would have at this moment in the conversation the policy opened to the part of the illustration that shows what the cash value might be in year 10 and 20. And if things work out, 
and they really should in most iterations, is that there'd probably be more than enough cash value in year 20 to make up for what was put in. And so the reality is, is the total outlay over here is zero versus the cost of the installment plan. I have actually never had a client say, I like the installment pl plan best. And in the situations where there was still a little, little hemming and hawing, it was mostly about an objection that just hadn't come out yet about something else. And so we, uh, you know, had, we dealt with that. So that's, that's my, my conversation about buy-sell planning. Um, in moving ahead with a client, once you've demonstrated that to the client, if they haven't gone to the attorney and they don't have a buy-sell, it's getting them over to the, the attorney to let the attorney and the accountant, you and the client, come up with the type of buyout. And then you'll know who needs to own it, whether it's going to be entity-owned or cross-owned. Cross so that's business succession. That's, um, I think, one of the most important things that we can offer to any and all of the business owner clients we have. Whether they've been in business for a year, 10 years, 50 years, have the conversation with them. You'll be amazed how often they either don't have it, haven't looked at it for a long time, are undervalued. Right after the recession, we're overvalued. Sometimes we need some adjustments there. Um, have let the term insurance lapse or the term insurance simply expired that they first bought um, many, many years ago or they're at the end of the term insurance. It is an amazing opportunity. And I'll tell you, having the business succession conversation, like having the human life value conversation, can lead you to all other places. Because you don't want to just do that in a vacuum. Part of what we usually find here is that it leads to conversations about qualified plans and non-qualified plans. And depending on the situation, sometimes premium finance, um, often Section 79. So let's, let's move to non-qualified plans. And we'll make our way to some of the other concepts. So non-qualified plans. A lot of us call it executive benefits. I, I call it executive benefits, particularly when I'm, I'm talking with clients. Because you use the term non-qualified, they have no clue what you're talking about. You know, they kind of have heard of qualified plans. But really, what does a non-qualified plan mean? Well, for technicians, like a lot of the folks here in, in, in my department, non-qualified means that it's a plan that's being offered to the key people, to the highly compensated, to the management group. Um, but in talking to regular folks, you know, it's an executive benefit. It's for your executives in your business. And it's designed to help improve their lives. And by doing that, um, help improve the bottom line to the, to the company. Now, in non-qualified plans and executive benefits, who are you talking about? Who are you looking for as a client? Well, it's probably a little smaller than the business succession marketplace, because business succession is really for everybody. But the executive benefit arrangement arena is for any business, whether it's an LLC, a limited liability company, a partnership, uh, C Corp, S Corp, medical practice, dental practice, vet practice, you know, whether it's a professional office, you'll see the non-qualified plans, the executive benefit arrangements become of interest to the business. One, with the business owner themselves, so you have the business owner. I'm drawing a strange picture here, I know. But the business owner, who's kind of standing at the, the top of the heap, realizes that they want or need a certain level of additional uh, retirement money, supplemental income, disability protection, things like that, where their own personal needs have come to the front. And they would like to use business money to do that. Okay, so the business owner has the needs or the wants, and they would like to use the business money. So that's the client you're looking for. But you're also looking for those businesses that have key executives who don't own the business. Right? They're important to the business bottom line, and the business owner knows it. And so I've, I've run into cases where you know, we've had uh, medical practices where you had two or three doctors, you know, senior doctors own it, and they were trying to figure out how to have uh, executive benefits that would tie younger doctors and some of their key administrators and nurses into the practice. 
perfect opportunity there. Manufacturing plants, um, retail stores, wherever there is the possibility that you're going to find some key folks who are not owners, executive benefit arrangements will also be an, an important conversation. Okay, so there are all types of executive benefits. Non-qualified area is kind of an umbrella term. It covers a lot of different things. And when you're talking with clients, you know, some just want short-term incentives, uh, you know, something that's going to make sense for the employee the next four, five, six years, longer term, 10 years or more. There are some, some clients who absolutely, absolutely are uh, concerned and need to deal with current taxation issues. They're looking for deductible plans currently deductible plans. And then others are looking for and comfortable with deferred tax deductions. And then some will tell you cost recovery. So there are a lot of options here. And I would tell you departments like, like mine, folks like Mike Zemaretti, part of what we can do to help is that if you've got a situation where the client has said, well, I've got this. What do I do with it? We can help break down all these issues. Now, where you end up going? with, with non-qualified plans, with the executive benefits, is in considering this. This is the business timeline, just like the business timeline and the buy-sell. Some executive benefits, you get a credit today and you pay it out today, and then there are some that you pay later. So let me just make that a little, little clearer with, with our little charts here. And by the way, this is all available. Um, for you to be able to use. So really three different, or you know, it looks like two, four, let's call it four, four different common executive benefits. And there's actually five that we do here at National Life uh, that includes Section 79, which I'll get to in just a couple of secs. So if you've got a client who says, I've got the cash flow to provide for myself, a key executive or two, or just the business owner, because these are discriminatory plans. You can pick and choose who you want to participate within that highly comped group, that management group. The bonus plan is where you get to deduct the premium today, right? So you bonus the premium on a permanent policy owned by the executive. The company gets 100% deduction. The executive will include the premium in income, so it's includable. The executive's out-of-pocket cost, though, is the tax due on the bonus. So if I write a check from the business for $10,000 and the executive's in a 25% tax bracket, the executive's out-of-pocket cost to acquire this policy is only $2,500, which is often a really great deal for the executive. Now, sometimes we do something called a, a double bonus where the business will bonus the 2500 in cash to the executive, so they've got cash to, to do it. And sometimes we've got um, a business owner who doesn't require the executive to have what I'd call skin in the game, in which case we do an extra bonus and we do a calculation that creates a zero out-of-pocket result for the executive. It's kind of a, one of those circular calculations. Great plans. Another way that we pay the tax is in year two or in year three, depending on uh, the product design. The executive can reach into the policy and withdraw from the, the policy an amount equal to the tax, so they have the cash from the policy itself to pay the tax. And usually you only have to start withdrawing ta uh, money that way in year two. So inside the executive bonus, bonus world, if you've got a client who is uh, the business owner who wants to provide benefits to themselves and pay the tax and are willing to pay the tax or have the company pay the tax on themselves and or they have key executives that they want to get this bonus to, they don't want a plan that's fussy, they don't want to have to do a lot of paperwork, they want to send stuff to the Department of Labor, you know, meet all those rules, a bonus plan is a perfect solution for them. The next step is a selective incentive plan. So as opposed to the, the bonus, which is here's the money today, the policy is yours, tax deductible, tax includable, the selective incentive plan, sometimes called deferred compensation, sometimes called salary continuation, it all basically means the same thing. It's, it's real simple. The business is making a promise, and this, it's a contractual promise, 
to pay an amount to our executives sometime in the future, usually at retirement. Although if you've got a short-term incentive deal, it could be four years, five years, 10 years, but it's basically the business says to the executive, you stay with me for this period of time. When you retire, we're going to pay out some money. So for instance, let's say the business says, we're going to pay you 20000 a year at your retirement age, 67, and we're going to do that for 10 years. Common, common design. The great part about these kind of plans is the design is almost infinite. It's up to your imagination. Do you need it to be $10,000 for 20 years? Fine. Do you need it to be or want it to be $25,000 forever? Fine. All of those are possible. Of course, the design and the cost is going to vary depending on the design. The key here is that these plans are funded with permanent life insurance that's owned by the business. And the policy becomes an asset on the business's books. The cash value is usually used to help pay for the, the, defer, the deferred payment. So you build up the sinking fund and you pay it out to the executive. It's growing tax deferred and tax free for the business up on the business balance sheet. So it becomes a valuable asset for the business. And then the death benefit when paid is paid income tax free so the business will cost recover that way. Now, who would you be looking for? for a plan like this? Well, you need a business that is going to be around for a while. To have a deferred comp selective incentive plan kind of deal where the business is either going to retire or die with the business owners, not a great prospect for this. So if you've got a business that's got a business succession plan in place, knows they want to provide benefits to a, a, a small group of folks, their key executives, the business owners themselves, and is willing to create the informal funding through the permanent life policy and are comfortable when building that asset, that is a perfect client for this kind of plan. Okay. Then we've got these two split dollar plans. These are a little bit different. Split dollar economic benefit is where the business is going to provide a death benefit only. So they say to the, the executive, listen, we're going to buy a permanent life policy on you. And we are going to allow you to name the beneficiary for a piece of it. And the cost to you is the tax that would be due on the term value of that. So it's a really tiny out-of-pocket cost. Now, is that much of an incentive? It often is used, this plan, the split dollar economic benefit plan, is often used in conjunction with the selective incentive plan. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it other than to say that where you are doing a selective incentive plan, either a deferred compensation plan or a salary continuation plan, we will often combine it with this economic benefit plan so we can get tax-free death benefit to the executive's family. It is a great combination. But the other program that we are seeing a big pickup on in the last, I'd say, nine months is the split dollar loan program. Very simple in concept. The business is going to advance the premium on a permanent life policy owned by the executive. That advance is treated as a loan. So for the executive, the out-of-pocket cost is really the interest that's due on the amount that's loaned. The business will take a collateral assignment. It's like a real loan, so it is a real loan. So the business's interest is equal to the premiums it's paid over time. So if in however many years the premium paid, let's say the business has loaned the executive 100000 it's going to get that 100000 back. Plus during the term, it would have gotten some interest back. The executive, at the end of the period, let's say that 10 years, the money goes back to the business from the cash value of the policy. The executive walks away from this deal with a permanent life policy. The cost would have been the interest that was due on the deal. Now, if you've got a client who has a C corporation, and I know a lot of you are probably sitting there going, I, I don't see C, C corporations. I'm here to tell you that that's the comeback that's happening. Uh, because we now have C corporations that can be in lower tax brackets than the business owner's personal bracket, you know, business could be sitting in a 25% bracket, the individual business owner could be sitting in a 40, 41, 42% personal bracket. If I could tell that client, you can pay for your permanent life policy 
out of a lower tax bracket, so you're paying for it out of a 25% bracket than a 40% bracket, you're going to get some interest in having that conversation. So that's one set of clients that you're going to look for. If you happen to come across a client who does have a C corporation, and that corporation is in a lower tax bracket than the executive, let that red light go off in your head. Ellen said, and Mike Zemaretti said, start thinking about split dollar loan plans. Pick up the phone and give us a call. Again, the key here is the tax leverage. Now, if you're talking about a plan for key executives who are not owners, then you, you're not worried so much about this tax advantage, this tax leverage. So it's not just C corporations you'd be limited to. It would be S's and LLC's and, and partnerships even. So in any of those situations where you're trying to create a benefit for a key executive, again, LLC, S Corp, partnership, C Corp, any of those entities, what you can do in this split dollar plan is create a golden handcuff, because remember the executive's permanent life policy is tied to the business as long as that assignment is in place. And the executive gets to acquire this permanent life policy with all of the accelerated benefit riders, with all the liber riders, the possibility of having tax-free income um, at a cost of interest on the plan, and the business gets to recover its money. We, we Split dollar plans up until about 10 years ago were, were a big market. Split dollar rules changed at that point, and C corporations became um, a smaller and smaller marketplace. But in the last year, because of, of tax rule changes and because of just an increased interest in doing this with interest rates being so low, we have seen a tremendous pickup in this area. Okay, so that's, that's, that's your non-qualified plan world. Now, I know we have only a few minutes left, so I just want to spend a few minutes on it on Section 79 plans. Now, when you think about non-qualified, the selective incentive plans, and we thought about bonuses, interest, the great part about a bonus plan is that it's 100% deductible, right? It's, com companies love it. The downside to the bonus plan, from the perspective perhaps of the business owner who wants the benefit, is that while they get a current tax deduction on the bonus, right, the, in a straightforward bonus, the tax result for the business owner participant is 100% inclusion. Well, in a Section 79, we say, all right, let's, let's put bonus plan on steroids. Let's get 100% tax deduction for the business today, but only a partial inclusion for the executive, for the business owner, or whoever participates in the permanent part of the group plan. So up here, and I'm just going to pick some numbers out of the hat here. Let's say the premium was ten thousand dollars or twenty, or you know, pick a number, a hundred thousand. A lot of these plans have very high premium numbers, but let's say in this case it's ten thousand because I can multiply by tens. Ten thousand dollar premium, hundred percent tax deductible going into this Section 79 permanent plan, and for my executive who's receiving the permanent policy, they're not including ten thousand in income. They'll include anywhere from six to maybe 6,500 in income. So they get to exclude between, let's say, 30 to 40 percent of the premium. So now what we have is a tax leverage going on. 100 percent deductible, only 60 to 65 percent includable. I'm getting a discount of about 30 to 35 percent to buy my permanent policy. And you know what? IRS tells us this is okay. They've laid out the rules in Section 79 and the regulations that they wrote under that section. Now, to do that, I'll, I'll describe what you're looking for in just a second. Part of what we look for when we, when we consider whether a Section 79 plan is a good fit with the client, one, you know, do you have business owners that are looking for supplemental income that want death benefit? that are tax motivated. Uh, when we talk Section 79, if the, if the client is very neutral about taxes, if they don't care about inclusions and deductions, we're probably going to look at a bonus plan. But if, if they say, listen, we, we need our tax advantage plans, tax deductible, partially includable, 
we are going to head right for Section 79 because that's the, the, the tax motivation there will be very important in that situation. The other thing is if there are key people in the business and, you, and you're happy in including them, Section 79 permanent makes a lot of sense. So how does this all work? It's really simple. Um, again, you're going to get the business tax deduction and a special tax inclusion rule. So it's 100% deductible, only about 60% includable. What do you get? Well, you get life insurance death benefits for all the employees. And for the employees who select the permanent option, they'll also get the cash value and all the living benefits in the permanent policy. All the accelerated benefit riders, the opportunity to use the liver rider. Um, all the things that make life insurance, you know, the live too long, die too soon, become ill aspect of permanent life is built in into the permanent option in this plan. And for the rank and file, what they'll get is income tax-free death benefits and the possibility of the permanent policy for those rank and file or key executives that choose to take the permanent policy. It is portable, so the key people like that, you know, they can pick it up and and take it over time. Now these are five-year funded plans. So as you're hopefully taking some notes here, when you, when you start to find a client who is tax motivated, is looking for supplemental retirement and death benefit protection for themselves and maybe a key executive or two is willing to offer the group plan as an option to all of the employees, actually offer all of the plan to all of the employees but also would have the cash flow to fund this plan over five years, because this is a five-year funding plan. Now, they're not absolutely obligated. If something happens in year three or four and you have to change the plan, you can. So it's not a technical lock-in for five years, but these plans are designed for maximum funding for five years, and then you're done. So you're looking for a company with that kind of cash flow history. You're also looking for a company. If the benefit is going to be provided to the owner, we also need to have a C, company, a C corporation. Now, again, for those of you who are sitting there going, you know, she's talking about C corporations again. They're not in my client list. Well, in most of the cases that we've had, we've done thousands of these. For the most part, we've always started out with, I'd say 80% of the time, the clients came to us with S corps or LLCs, a couple of partnerships thrown in. And in working with the client and their accountant, a C corporation, I call it a sister or a brother C corporation, is established to do some work for and with the parent company. So you're creating a, essentially a control company. And money flows over to the C corporation from this business. And the C corporation is the company that ultimately provides the benefit to the owner. I know that's a lot of technical detail that I just threw at you in a minute, but the key is is don't stop thinking about Section 79 just because the company that you're working with is an S Corp or an LLC. The conversation about creating a, a C corporation is not a difficult one. We'll work with you on that. And since uh, our TPAs are very skilled in that conversation, um, again, practically any business that has cash flow that could sustain a five-year program with an owner who really wants supplemental income instead of or in addition to qualified plans or any of the other plans, a Section 79 has become a very, very powerful tool. OK. So remarkably, we've looked at business succession and non-qualified or executive benefits, a subset of which is Section 79. Let me spend one, maybe just a couple of minutes on qualified plans. It's another big marketplace for us, for you to think about uh, when you're dealing with business owners. Now, we find the sweet spot. Of course, in a, in a qualified plan, clients love it because your company's putting money in now. It's completely tax deductible to the, to the business. Not includable in current income. Clients love that. So tax deductible, not includable. It will grow on a tax deferred basis. And yes, when the, when the plan pays out, you're going to include it in income. So qualified plans work great with any client who is looking for a tax deductible, not includable solution, maybe because they're in a very 
high tax bracket, both on the business side or perhaps certainly on the personal side, that they may be near retirement and you know are trying to put a lot of money away for themselves. And I'll describe that in a second. Let me take you to the three areas that we see a lot of here. One is a profit sharing plan. Most often in the plan designs that we see, because we, you know, we specialize in closely held businesses, is this combination of 401k and profit sharing plan. And in the combination of the two, we're able to actually get fairly large contributions that are allocated mostly for the business owner. You know, in the 401k, getting big contributions in just for the business owners is just is really nearly impossible you know based on the way that the rules are set up how much can go in and how much your rank and file put in will impact what the key people do we most often see these plans combined with profit sharing plans what we also specialize in are the special defined benefit plans and we spend a lot of time in fully insured plans. And that's a qualified plan that is funded part annuity and part life insurance. Now, it doesn't have to be split funded that way. It can be all annuity, but we see a lot of very effective plans with both in there. Now, who, who is the client for that? In a fully insured plan, the client that you're looking for is a small business, 10 or fewer employees, really is the sweet spot for that. Older clients. Uh, folks who are in their mid-50s who are really strongly starting to think about retirement, they can actually see it now, that have a good cash flow and are willing to put a fair amount of money into these plans. We see you know, anywhere from small, smaller plans of $40,000, $50,000 going in, split funding the annuity and the life insurance, all the way up to hundreds of thousands going in for small businesses. The reason is, is that the contribution is based on some of the non-forfeiture guarantees that are built in here, and we build them to be small guarantees. Now, they actually pay higher numbers than the guarantees most of the time, but the calculation is based on the product that we've built to work in this market, and so the contributions really you know, are, can be much higher than what you see in profit sharing plans. Now. If you've got those clients, the key is finding folks who can design the plans for you. In the qualified plan department here at National Life Group, I would put the design team up against any group of designers in the country. I really would. They, they are amazing. All they need from you is a census with the, you know, the, the names and the, the salary and when they started work and who you want to provide a higher benefits to because they can manipulate some of those numbers within the rules set out in the code. Um, and they'll put a design together, work you, work with you on it, coach you on it, and um, help you close those cases. And again, if you've got the clients, don't worry about knowing all the details right off the bat. If it's not a market that you've worked in before, we are here, Mike is there to, to help you sort out First, which is the right plan? I mean, we just went through qualified, non-qualified, Section 79, you know, business, where do you start? What's the track to run on? Uh, and we will help you design these plans, put you in touch with the TPAs on the Section 79 that can work with you on that, um, and, and see where the client's needs fit best within all of those choices. So that's kind of why I love, what a, what why I love the business market. Michael. Hey there, Ellen. <laughs> yes. I think we're almost running out of time. Yes. You're doing a phenomenal job. And I'm sold. I'm an agent at heart. But I have to ask this burning question because I know of all the people, and there's a lot of people on the line listening, this was terrific. And you answered the second part of my question as, you know, kind of an infomercial as to what you do and your qualified plans team and, and the advanced sales team. But here's the big burning question. With all of your experience, and you've seen this day in and day out, I'm an agent that has relationships uh, of business owners that I've been holding back because maybe I feel that I'm a little uncomfortable and not as confident as I need to be. So I've heard that you're going to, pardon the expression, hold my hand and shepherd me through this process. But here's the burning question. How, in your mind, should an agent 
approach both existing known relationships or maybe cold calling prospecting business owner relationships. How do you open these conversations, keeping it simple, without mm -hmm. throwing all this technical stuff, I can bring a Section 79 to you, I can bring qualified plans, a buy, sell, this, that. What would you recommend be the starting conversation that would motivate a business owner to look further into this and, and, mm -hmm. and, and get the process going? Yeah, Michael, that's, that's a great question. I've got a, about a minute to answer it before I have to get to a, a meeting okay, here. Okay, that's but, fine. Um, I, th there are a number of ways to do that, and one of my favorites, and I'll be happy to share the, the material with you, Michael, and you can send it off to everybody. We have things called stress tests, buy-sell stress tests, qualified plan stress tests, executive benefit stress tests. They are a series of simple questions, yes, no, don't know questions on a fillable PDF. And what I do with my clients and what a lot of our planners are doing is they take this stress test to an existing client. They send it out in an email that, you know, we've, we, we would like you to, to fill this in. Um, getting ready for an annual review, please fill it in. You know, even if you've got a plan, that's terrific. Let's take a look at it. Just do a checkup. Let's do this stress test to make sure it's doing what you want it to do and what you think it's doing. And you can send two or three. They take a less than two minutes to fill in. And they are really designed more as disturbing scenarios because it, it's it's going to get the client thinking, well, you just ask me about this qualified plan, you know, and I know I have a 401k, but what do they mean about profit sharing plans? That gets you the opportunity and the permission to go in and talk about these concepts. Terrific. So that's what that's that's some of the those are some of the tools that we've put together to do just exactly what you were talking about. And I think one of my favorites, Ellen, is just simply, this is really simplistic, just talking to the business owner and then in that conversation say simply, tell me about your business. How are things oh, going? Yeah. And just be quiet mm -hmm. and let them tell you and inevitably some of the concerns will come up. You know, business is great, it was slow, but now it's great. And, and I love the expression, when you're having a great year, so is Uncle Sam and the IRS because they're licking their chops waiting to collect the taxes from you. They are partners in your success. That's Ellen, sure. what a great job. I apologize Ellen, to everyone again. This is Kathy. Go ahead. Real quick Go ahead, here. Kathy. Um, George asked a question. Is executive bonus a 79 or 162 section? A bonus is a 162. OK. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to give us a call at Premier at 1-800-365. 8208, and we'll be glad to help you out with this. And we are recording this, so hopefully we can get the recording back out to everybody that was on. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate okay. your time. Thank, thank you. you. Ellen, thank sorry you, about that Have a delay. Great day, everyone. That's Thanks. fine. Bye -bye. Thanks bye -bye. a lot. Bye-bye.